Midday Mornings with Anna Foster. BBC Newcastle, radio for the North East. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show uh, today, for, for, well, for listening to the show today. Um, we've got loads of good stuff for you. Coming up in the next half hour, you're going to meet a fascinating character. A young gentleman whose nickname is Edwardian Paul. <laughs> his, his nickname is Edwardian Paul, and yet his day job is, is connecting rural parts of Northumberland to the future, the internet. So we thought that juxtaposition was really interesting, and, um, and we had great fun together, and there was some calamity along the way because... He likes the Edwardian period. Clearly, he's got an Edwardian car. So we had a trip in it. We've got an excellent guest for you. Uh, my guest in the next 10 minutes is a gentleman called Edwardian Paul, and you are going to enjoy it. I really hope that you will enjoy it. I have to say, um, I've, I've loved interacting uh, with you, you know, with, with the listener. You're the person that counts. And also meeting incredible people, real characters. So I'm not talking about celebrities. Celebrity, yeah, no, you meet the odd one that's nice, but celebrities, celebrities, whatever. Real people, people who are part part of the tapestry of everyday life in this uh, incredible place we call home, the North East. Um, one who would particularly amaze you is the one that you're going to meet today. His name is Paul Smith. He is affectionately known as Edwardian Paul. Uh, and he's an amazing character. He lives his life, to all intents and purposes, as if he was living in Edwardian times. His demeanour, his clothes... Even his drinking habits all revolve around his love of that era and he even volunteers at Beamish on the trams. However, the juxtaposition of that is his day job is that he started a company and runs a company installing broadband in rural areas uh, with Air Nexus. So that's the, that's the broadband provider. So what he's doing in one sense is living his life in a bygone era and yet kind of dragging us into the 21st century, which I think is really interesting. So how does he reconcile the two with very stiff collars and a bit of Edwardian fly tipping? as you'll hear shortly. What a pleasant evening to be sitting outside a beautiful pub, the Anchor in Wittenstall, with Edwardian Paul. I'm finally meeting the legend. So I guess the first question, Edwardian Paul, is why... Well, as uh, somebody once said to me, and I always thought you were mad, and uh, now I'm certain, what yeah. with the car and the, uh, the outfit, but yeah. uh, yes. I mean, Paul, you are a very young man. How old are you? I'm 26 there, going on 126, I know. It's uh, a bit of an unusual lifestyle, I suppose. There certainly can't be many jobs like this uh, where you can go about dressed as, uh, well, in this case, we were 1935, something like Siegfried Farnan from All Creatures Great and Small, and go around connecting people, you know, and you, we go in and fit super fast broadband into areas that really struggle, you know, sometimes less than one meg. I suppose in the early days, uh, Postman perhaps took the odd uh, look at this uh, Edwardian man clambering across uh, rooftops and things like that, but nobody turns an eyelid now. It's, uh, it's pretty much par for the course. So are you literally there in all of your Edwardian dress on a roof? connecting it. That's absolutely right and just to uh, complete the picture Anna sometimes the, uh, the roof tiles get very hot uh, for a person's behind so uh, <laughs> so yes you need a good footing and these uh, Edwardian style shoes aren't always the best for that type of thing. But the thing is Paul is that you're not dressing up for your job as it were this is you this is who you are isn't it? Well, I suppose so, yes. It kind of started off as a bit of an interest, I suppose, and then it kind of got a hold of you. Gone are the days now where gentlemen were always smartly turned out, even in the pub, you know, perhaps their waistcoats were uh, moth-eaten and dropping the bits, but the gentlemen always turned out smartly dressed. When you go out in T-shirts and jeans, that you feel underdressed, and so it really does get a hold of you. And this is it, set, set me away now. So how old are you? I suppose when you first got a fascination with the Edwardian way of life. Well, I've always been interested in tram cars, of all things, would you believe? You know, most youngsters are uh, expected to be interested in football and the likes, but for me it was the, the electric motors, the sound of air compressors from a bygone era kind of thing. <laughs> so I started volunteering uh, about two years ago at Beamish, helping to restore the tram cars, and then in recent sort of months driving. And I think that really has uh, kind of sparked another interest, and it's, uh, as I say, an unusual subject, but very much a part of the everyday life for me now. I dare say some parents might, you know, have to come to terms with perhaps their child might come out in one way or another, but I've come out as an Edwardian <laughs> Yes, you have. <laughs> and it's a very beautiful and elegant thing. Now, obviously, as far as the Edwardians are concerned, when people think of Edwardian times, they'll think of Beamish, they'll think of Downton Abbey. And it's a little bit of a, I suppose, a fairy tale look at it. But in reality, Edwardian life was damn tough, wasn't it? If you were working class, you were a baker, you were lucky to get to 40 because life was really hard. So I'm guessing you've modelled yourself on a richer Edwardian. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, uh, as this kite will testify, the buttons on the waistcoat are just about popping off on her, and I doubt whether that would have been the case had I been sort of, you know, the working man back in those days. Yeah. They're absolutely right. It certainly was a really hard time of it, you know, and there was a lot of poverty. But that said, you know, they really were an industrial kind of mindset and, and actually really sort of early pioneers. I mean, uh, you have to remember, uh, just to talk about tram cars for a bit, some of these cars used to trundle past houses which at the time didn't even have electric themselves. So to see a car passing with electric lights must have been quite something, you know. Yeah. And also something that's uh, that I find quite humorous. A lot of people, when they had electricity fitted to the houses, thought that it was a dangerous thing leaking out of the sockets. This newfangled technology. So I suppose to, uh, to clutch in its drawers and to dry and draw some parallel here, Anna, had the Edwardians had access to this kind of technology, probably they would have been doing the same thing. But yeah. they, were... <laughs> they, they, they probably would, you're absolutely right. When you were at uni, I know you had a bit of a fascination, again, with a kind of a bygone era, because most kids that get to uni at 18, 19 years old, they get into halls, they yes. behave badly, they get drunk and their houses are a tip. But for you, life was a bit different. Well, I'm not for a minute mislead you and have you believe that uh, my accommodation wasn't a tip either. <laughs> To be honest, Annie, I, th- I think I studied more of the pubs than I did the subject I was reading. How we pulled the first off, I'll never really know. But <laughs> for the second year, I moved on to an Arab, you see, which was certainly alternative. Well, your student digs all very well, but renting is dead money, you know, and it can be very expensive. So did you buy the narrow boat? I did, yes. Well, I was uh, fortunate and for some of the other adventures. I had a bit of money set aside, and, of course, uh, dear old Granny Smith came to the rescue with a, <laughs> a considerable amount. Yeah. And so, really, it was you know, certainly a, a novel kind of uh, accommodation. So those were the days. So how did people your age react to you? Because I know you're hugely popular in this village, polite and genial and full of good humour. I just wonder how people your age react to do you get strange looks or are people kind of wowed by you? Well, uh, yeah, certainly just the first part there, terms and conditions certainly do apply. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I suppose to begin with, you know, you, you perhaps had the odd glance, but I, I guess really it's a sign of the times. You know, society is very uh, open-minded nowadays and uh, people generally just let you get on with it. I do recall one episode, however, as I was going up to, to do some uh, shopping there and this old lady came up to me and she says, my goodness, she said, you remind me of me dad. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that's a compliment really, but it was probably something to do with the starch collars, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> now, there must be pitfalls to dressing like this because are you pretty much like this all of the time? Yes, most of the time and uh, sometimes through the night as well. If I can't get the uh, starch collars off because I'm too drunk, I just go to sleep (laughs) with them on anyway. (laughs) So the starch collars, because that's, I I guess when you look at Edwardian fashion, that's probably the tweed and the actual cut of the jib, I suppose, was, was very, very important. How uncomfortable are they? Well, there's different types of collars. And Go on, bore me with them. <laughs> well, you have the Arundel, you've got the double rounded, and uh, I think the Imperial. The Imperial, if I've got that correct, is probably the most uncomfortable. It really is a tall collar and it sticks sort of into your neck in one thing. But as I say, the, uh, the company I ordered them from, uh, the, the lady, she said, Well, mine, she says, you'll not find this very comfortable. I said, Well, true Edwardian fashion, well, we've got to give it a go, you see. Yeah. But actually, you know, the funny thing about the starch collars on it is they've got to be sent off to Bournemouth. There's only one place left now, as far as I'm aware, in the country that can actually clean these things and, and shape them. So, yes, it's certainly not a case of throw everything in the washing machine. <laughs> now, when you actually... I mean, I don't, have you got a lady in your life? I do, actually, as it do happens. Uh, I know, unfortunately. Uh, otherwise, I'd have asked you. <laughs> <I'd> be, uh, <laughs> you flirt, you. <laughs> uh, I dare say, uh, years ago, it would have been the case that for a lady getting a man's collar off would have been a hard job. Uh, yeah. Never mind a man taking a lady's bra off. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> but certainly, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to be quite particular about, you yeah. know, the, the line down the middle of your trousers have got to be properly ironed in and this sort of thing. Yeah. But, uh, well, keeping up appearances, don't you know? In terms of expense, Puck, because fashion is very disposable now and a lot of people think that's a very bad thing. You know, it's better to buy less but buy better. Mm. Is this an expensive way to live your life as an Edwardian? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it certainly can be. The materials are obviously quite uh, robust. Uh, Tweed, as I understand originally, was actually a cloth for the working classes before the country uh, folk got a hold of it. And uh, it is, it's very hard wear and it certainly comes in handy when you're clambering across rooftops. (laughs) But I dare say, you know, a good tailor-made suit, uh, you you know, you wouldn't be surprised at a bill of uh, in excess of a thousand or a couple of thousand pounds. I'm afraid uh, I don't have quite that luxury. Most of this is cobbled together off an online auction place, shall we (laughs) say. (laughs) <laughs> so if you just joined us on BBC Newcastle Radio for the North East, um, you're not in 1935. You're listening to my fascinating guest, so charming as well. Uh, his name is Paul Smith, affectionately known um, in his in his loking, local drinking establishment as Edwardian Paul. Um, fascinating young lad who, his demeanour, his clothes, even his drinking habits all revolve around his love uh, of that era. And yet the juxtaposition is that for a day job, 
He's dragging us in rural Northumberland into the 21st century, uh, installing Air Nexus broadband. Um, so it's a really odd juxtaposition, isn't it, that you have this sense of the past and yet at the same time um, a huge knowledge about the future. Uh, here's Taylor Swift. More from Paul after the news and Chris Rear on the way. Earlier this week, I spent some time with certainly... Um, one of Northumberland's more eccentric residents. Lots of people know him. Fascinating character, really uh, warm, endearing person. His name is Paul Smith, uh, otherwise known as Edwardian Paul. Now, one of the things I really like about spending time with him was his impeccable manners. And just to explain, Paul is 26, but there's something about him which is of a bygone era. He loves the Edwardian era, the clothes, the manners, the lifestyle. Um, and he studied the etiquette as well of that era. So he's very much a gentleman. What is interesting and the, the kind of juxtaposition of his life is that yes, that's that's who he is, but also at the same time, his job is connecting parts of uh, rural Northumberland to Tinternet because it's been a bit slow, you know, it's like dial-up, <laughs> like dial-up in the countryside um, with, with his company, with Air Nexus. So it's an interesting juxtaposition. He takes transport very, very seriously, and that is something you would know if you'd ever seen him motoring around in his car. It is a sight to behold, and very kindly, he offered to take me out for a drive which was both hilarious, romantic and eventful, as you will hear. Well, firstly, Anne, I'll just have to put my hat on there. I mean, uh, you know, the gentleman's sort of image. Uh, <laughs> no, just joking aside, this is actually uh, an Austin 16 from 1935. So uh, we're going to move forward in time a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, it's, uh, wow! Uh, she is incredible! Well, I don't believe there are many left. Uh, and this actually came from, uh, from uh, sort of North Yorkshire way. And, and I will tell you this, uh, before this uh, owning this car, I'd never greased as many nipples in all my life. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and just to clarify, I mean, underneath the car there, those are the dirty disposition. Yes. Uh, you know, you have to get underneath there and, and with yeah. a grease gun and one thing or another. And, and some of these things are a weekly kind of uh, job, you know, maintenance. But as well, what makes me sort of smile, you read the, uh, the owner's manual and their instructions in there showing you how to sort of decarbonise the engine. People nowadays, uh, if it wasn't for putting windscreen washer in the fluid, would have, never have the bonnet up, never mind. Take exactly, the engine apart. So, exactly. Uh, uh, yes, it's very interesting, it really is, when you start delving into these things. You know, I mean, actually, you'd be surprised. The insurance and this kind of thing uh, for classic vehicles is quite inexpensive, and with that includes European breakdown cover. Excellent, <laughs> let's get in her. Thank you, good sir. I've had the door open for me. That's never happened before. Well, it's not very often you have Anna Foster in your car. Oh, goodness. Charmer. Yeah, this is fantastic. I don't think there's a seatbelt. <laughs> right, <laughs> let's power her up then. Well, let's hear her. Well, uh, this might be uh, eventful in itself. Okay. I think sometimes there's no one's fine for this thing. But, uh, okay. Right, so ignition on. Right. What a Beautiful noise, absolutely gorgeous noise. That's amazing. We're probably running on uh, vapors there now, Anna, so we'll have, to, uh, we'll have a trip down to the garage and we'll put some fuel in. I just got an invitation through the mail. Your presence requested this evening. It's formal, a top hat, a white tie, and tails. Nothing now could take the wind out of my sails. Because I'm invited to step out this evening with top hat, white tie, and tails. Now, she's beautiful, but we have broken down. <laughs> Myself and Edwardian Paul have managed to get at least half a mile, and it was the most, I cannot explain what an incredibly romantic feeling it is, because you often wonder when you see people in vintage cars, you think, why? Because she's going to break down, or it's going to be expensive to run, or it's going to be a nightmare, and yet there is something which feels incredibly romantic. Right, I better go and see if I can help. Problem number two, I can't get out from the inside. <laughs> oh, she's... We're on again. The mission's back on. Let's go before we stop, Anna. <laughs> we'll just get to the petrol station. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm stepping out, my dear, to breathe an atmosphere that simply reeks with class. And I trust that you'll excuse my dust when I step on the gas. Or I'll be there. Right. 
Well, we've made it. Our destination. <laughs> we only broke down twice, which was good. Once in the middle of the road, which was quite funny. Paul, that was lovely, and thank you so much for opening the opening the door for me. Doesn't it feel really quiet when you get out of her? Well, uh, yes. I mean, uh, apologies, listeners, if uh, I'm now shouting down the airwaves at you. But, uh, <laughs> the fact is, we're both uh, stone deaf now. Uh, <laughs> Back to the weird juxtaposition of your life, Paul. That you, you know, you're living your life as Edwardian Paul, yes. and yet you are, you know, not dragging. I wouldn't say he's dragging us, kicking and screaming, but you are, you're enabling us to to move forward into the future. How important do you think it is for people in rural areas to be connected? Because very often they're older. Well, the uh, the dragging, screaming, and kicking is the next uh, phase of our marketing uh, and, and sales <laughs> technique, uh, Anna. But, uh, but no, you're absolutely right, and some, uh, especially older people, can feel vulnerable with the isolation, and you know, and uh, what with uh, post office closures and one thing or another, drive for everything to be done online. There really is a huge sort of necessity for uh, fast enough broadband to enable people to, to sort of do their, uh, almost everyday things, you know. Yeah. And I suppose you know there is a real juxtaposition, to, you know, the very fact that I'm saying that because you know in many respects I pine for a, a time where life was arguably less complicated in the countryside. But I realised that if it wasn't uh, myself uh, delivering broadband, then somebody else would, and perhaps it'd be less sort of sympathetic to, uh, you know, to the older life, to older way of life kind of thing. So we've been talking a little bit about the perils of uh, <laughs> of living your life as an Edwardian, Paul, and whereabouts you get your dress from, and whereabouts you get your. I suppose your way of life from, and it can cause a problem. Well, it, well, it certainly can. On there, I mean, uh, one example there. Uh, in fact, the studs that uh, we use for, to attach the collars, uh, or rather, I used to attach the collars, were donated by somebody I drink with in the pub, which was very kind of them. One night, in a drunken stagger home, I uh, discovered a set of four Edwardian chairs outside the back of my house. So <laughs> I was thinking, I have to put a sign up saying "No Edwardian fly tipping, please." But, uh, <laughs> so yes, it does have some limitations when you can't even get to your house for Edwardian artifacts. But uh, I suppose there are worse things could happen. So to round off our chat with felt it might be right that we went into the local pub instead of sitting outside it and have a pint and so you drink in a very specific fashion as well that, that's right yes well here we have uh, a tankard which was actually uh, given to me on uh, graduation from Lancaster uh, and also these uh, I, I, you might have heard of um, an anti macassar the type of material which uh, elderly people used to uh, drape across the back of the, the seat uh, to protect the cushions and covers rather and the reason for that was because a gentleman used to wear macassar oil which was a very sort of you know kind of a heavy oil that they would wear in their hair uh-huh. just for uh, effect we've actually managed to source some macassar oil from Tahiti would you believe and uh, <laughs> I don't know if you want to have a, a bit sniff of that there on it oh that's really nice it is yeah I think well, so where I believe did that a, go in your hair it, you do yes you have to sort of rub it in your hands to soften it up yeah and uh, I gather it's a, a coconut oil and ylang ylang and uh, as one fella said to me, uh, he said, you smell like a eucalyptus tree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that one clean didn't work. Now, uh, have you any idea what uh, what you think this might be? It's right. a horseshoe-shaped box. OK, so uh, that to me looks like it could be a pair of binoculars. No. Um, or indeed a horseshoe. <laughs> well, well, I'm not one for collecting horseshoes, I'm afraid. It's an actual fact where you would keep your, uh, your stiff collars in. So ah. this one here, this, this actually was my great-grandfather's who uh, and my granny who recently dug it out. So it was to protect the, the stiff collars and stop them getting creased in one thing or another. And, uh, and in here we have the, uh, the very cufflinks that were given to me by someone in the pub, the, oh. the old-fashioned chain cufflinks. And, uh, and the collar studs as well, for fastening the, uh, the studs onto your shirt. They're beautifully made. Everything seems to be made well, doesn't Exactly. It? And notice, made in England. Ah, uh-huh, there <laughs> yes. we go. Ultimate premium quality. Yeah. But, uh, but as I say, had it not been for the studs and one thing or another, we couldn't have had the collars. So uh, thank you to that man. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least, of course, the Gladstone bag as well, which is uh, seen better days. There's a few uh, you know, patches here and there, but I use this on, on a daily basis. I carry the tools in. Uh, from job to job and one thing or another. But so if you see a gentleman who's coming towards your house to connect you to broadband, the bag is uh, over 100 years old and he's uh, sporting some fine tweed, a very fine hat and smells of eucalyptus oil. That, that, That's Edwardian Paul. That's about it, yes. <laughs> Putting down the top hat, mercing up my white tie, dancing in my tails, putting down my top hat, mercing up my white tie, so thank you so much uh, to Paul Smith. We had such a fantastic evening. 
you know, sometimes you finish your working day and you think, oh, that's it. And then we met, went back out and met him at seven o'clock at night. And honestly, time just flew. We had such a great time together. Um, really interesting, interesting young man, uh, Edwardian Paul, who, of course, lives his life in that kind of Edwardian fashion, actually sent me a text which just made me laugh. Um, in case of any confusion, Anna, you must remember the Edwardian period ended in 1910, extended to 1914 at the outbreak of the war. We were in the 1935 uh, car, which is why I was dressed in 1935 attire. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad that as a as a historian, we've kept things we've kept things factually correct. Um, so, Paul, thank you very much for your time. We had an absolutely fantastic evening. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as well.